people would always talk about sports, especially baseball, that it's easier to get there than it is to stay there. And whether it's business or sports, anything at a high level, it's easier to get there than it is to stay there. What I mean by that is when you get to the highest level, right, you've got there. And it can be very easy to let off the gas. But the reality of the situation is there's a bunch of other people that were just like Jacob that are just as talented that are coming behind me that might have a little more hunger because they've never been there. And now you got to keep fighting off those people every single year because they want your spot. They want your job. They want they want your real estate. They want your building. They want the workflow that you have. So it's easier to get there than it is to stay there. And the lesson for me was always like, you got to keep your foot on the gas no matter what. This is Country Club Conversations. I'm Raj Tut, founder and CEO of Storyboard Living. This show gives you actionable insights from the hard to reach top percentile in business and entrepreneurship. I think everyone deserves this type of access and I'm bringing it to you. Welcome to the club. Jacob, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, Raj, appreciate it, man. Appreciate you having me on. Really looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, I wanted to have you on because you're, well, first of all, we've only met went once before. And the one time we met, I thought you came across as very disciplined and motivated. And it wasn't until maybe halfway through our conversation that I found out the extent of your story and how, how much experience you already have in the business world or just the world of peak performance. Uh, you're a former MLB player, uh, currently an entrepreneur. Uh, your company, Moment Private Wealth, is uh, focused on wealth management for athletes. Is that correct? Athletes and entrepreneurs, yep. Okay, got it. And you started Moment uh, when you realized there was a gap in the world of wealth management for athletes? Well, you know, I think I've always loved personal finance. And much like you are with your real estate deals, we both agree that having a specific niche and having a specific focus ultimately it leads to better outcomes. It leads to better outcomes for your business. It leads to better outcomes for your customers. And I felt that way with, with the wealth management industry as a whole. What is something that we could be world-class at with a group of people that, one, we enjoy working with, but two, that we could really provide truly deep expertise with? So speaking of world-class, you know, we very briefly touched on the fact that you were in the MLB, uh, which is very rare and something that I think is very fascinating and speaks highly of you. The fact that you don't name drop the MLB or, you know, your time spent there yeah. in every conversation. I think that's very cool. Uh, very Midwest humble, if you will. Uh, so you're from St. Louis yeah. and you're back in St. Louis. Um, I'd be curious to know how far back can you trace your roots if we were to start your story before you were even born? When I think about my story, I think about growing up in a smaller town. I, mean, I grew up in St. Charles, Missouri, which is now kind of a, I don't want to say a booming metropolis, but it's an up and coming area. And it's been that way for really the last 20 years. But when we were first growing up there, it was kind of the middle of nowhere. And for me, when I think about my journey and everything, like St. Louis is, has a special place in it. Uh, my kids have grown up here now. I grew up here. My brothers still live here. And I always tell people there's a lot of amazing places in the world, but there's something about St. Louis, it just feels like home to me. And I think you touched on it too, Raj, just the the values that were instilled in me by my parents here are something that I think are slowly getting instilled in my kids, which is really important to me. Were your parents athletes or uh, was anyone in your family an athlete before you and your brothers picked up baseball? So my mom and dad both played tennis. We never played tennis. They both played tennis somewhat at the collegiate level. My mom did a little bit of softball growing up, but baseball, for whatever reason, was always the thing that we wanted to do. And I look at even, I have one son now. I look at his drive to play sports, and, and he loves sports. But the way that we loved sports at a young age was just kind of a different level. It was the end-all, be-all of every single day. And we would, I remember we used to play this baseball game in the front yard, we lived at the end of the cul-de-sac, so we would play this one game where it was like we were constantly hitting and practicing. I remember we got cable TV when I was like 10 years old, and we would watch Sports Center or Baseball Tonight on repeat. It was just constantly living and breathing sports and baseball specifically. And did that come naturally to you guys? So no push or not a big push from your parents? 
Yeah, my parents were always the ones that were, they wanted to be as supportive as we wanted to have the drive and the initiative to do it, which is this delicate balance as a parent. You want to see your kids succeed, but at the same time, I know for me, I will never live vicariously through my kids. If they want to do something and they want to put in the time and effort, uh, my wife and I will certainly support them in what they do. For whatever reason, baseball and sports in general was just what we had gravitated towards. When I say we, my, me and my two brothers, I think my parents just helped to, they helped to add fuel to that. They've made a ton of sacrifices, both time and resources to allow us to live out the dream that we wanted to. So your parents made the sacrifices, and of course you did as well. How did, how would you say your life differed from other kids growing up, given the fact that you were dedicating so much time to a sport? Well, there's this common there's this common battle online and just in the general population now of like, should kids focus on a sport too early? Should kids be playing all these games? And how I feel about it is probably different than what my actions dictated when I was younger. Uh, you know, when I was 10 years old, I think we played 100 games in the summer. When I was a freshman in high school, I was solely focused on playing baseball. So while I tell a lot of other kids today that I think they should focus on multiple sports, that I don't think you should get overwhelmed with sports at a really young age, the reality is to be elite at anything in life, whether it's sports, whether it's business, it takes the work. You can't there's no getting around the work. It takes what needs to be done and you have to be willing to do what needs to be done. And I think even at a young age, baseball in general is a, it takes athletic ability, but it's also a practice sport. What I mean by that is you can have a certain level of God given ability, but it doesn't require you to be six, eight and have a 40 inch vertical like the NBA would basically require you. There's a certain level of athletic ability, but there's also a certain level of ability of you putting in the time and effort and consistent practice to get your skills to a level that you can compete on the highest stage. It's interesting that you say that because I feel the same way. Like you can't work your way into the NBA, but I never thought of someone having the ability to work themselves into the MLB. So would you say that uh, your success was primarily due to your hard work or your natural ability or just a combination of the both. I did read or I, I might have read or watched this. Your brothers were better than you at a certain point in your lives growing up. Well, you know, as a competitive person. Or they might say even I, today, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, they would, say, they, would, they would even say today. I have one older brother, one younger brother. I'm the middle. So take that for what it is. But my older brother, I would generally would play up on his team. So a lot of the guys on this team were better than me, especially at a young age when you're developing. It's very hard to be playing at even just one age group up. It was a combination of talent and work ethic. I have a lot of God-given ability to throw a baseball really hard. Uh, there's no doubt about that. That was something that I was certainly blessed with. But it also took a ton of work and a ton of effort and a ton of discipline to get to the level I got to, to have the success I had that I just think most people wouldn't be willing to put in. They'd be willing to put it in when the times are good. And for a long time, the times were always good, but it wasn't always like that in baseball, much like the rest of life, right? There's times when everything's great and it's very easy to put in the work, but there's a lot of times when it's, it just takes putting in the work, even when you don't want to show up, you got to keep showing up every single day. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Who was the first person that said, hey, Jacob can make the MLB and uh, I believe in him. And and if you remember who that first person was, yeah. how did that feel for you? When you say that, I remember this, I remember one conversation and it happened at the most amazing spot. So I used to do pitching lessons back behind an old, it was like a kind of a car dealership, kind of an auto body shop. And on the backside, they had retrofitted it to put in some mounds and a couple of batting cages. The individual that I had worked with at the time was doing some pitching lessons back there. My brother and I would do hitting lessons afterwards. I can remember after one of the hitting lessons, the hitting instructor who had played a little bit professionally mentioned something to my dad about being, you know, Jacob has the ability to probably play like college baseball. And at the time, I want to say I was maybe 12, 13, 14, something around that age. My dad never told us any of this, but I remember him having a conversation with my mom at home about that. Like, oh, so-and-so said that, you know, Jacob might be able to do this. And I overheard them. I remember thinking like, wow, if I could do that, that would be the pinnacle. For me at the time, you know, growing up in St. Louis, if I could go play something like the University of Missouri and I could play baseball there, that was, 
is really as far out as I thought was realistic. Now, like I had the dream of playing professional baseball, but my parents never put it out there like, okay, you guys are talented enough to do that. You just keep working hard. And they would always, it was very much a head down mentality. So I never really had thought much past that. It's interesting you say that because I've heard from others they knew when they were four years old that they were going to make, you know, whatever the highest level is. Yeah. And I've also heard uh, other people, maybe myself included, that never really played at a competitive level, but still up until a certain age had the delusion of, hey, I can still go and make, you know, the NBA or the MLB or whatever. Yeah. So it's it's very interesting for you to say that. And you, it kind of like, it sounded like you alluded to your parents being the reason that you had that hand down mentality. Is that right? You know, it's an interesting dynamic because there's, to answer your question, yes, I would definitely say it was my parents, but it, there's this weird dynamic in anything in life where you have to have a self-belief in your own ability, whether it's it's business, whether it's sports, you have to believe that you can do it before anybody else is going to believe that you can do it, right? Like, why would I believe in you if you don't believe in yourself and vice versa? But on the flip side of that, there can be this struggle, I think, especially as a parent, but as anybody that's mentoring anybody else, a parent is obviously the ultimate mentor that you want to instill confidence, but you also don't want to give anybody a false sense of that, hey, you're really better than what you are or that you can rest on the fact that you're good. So it's this constant tug of war of giving somebody confidence, but also helping them understand that they haven't really done anything yet. Is that similar to how you're raising your kids today or planning on raising them as they grow a little older? My thing with my kids is you can teach them a million different things. I want them to be respectful. I want them to be humble. And I want them to be people of their word. Outside of that, there's going to be a lot of things I can't control. I think those three things, though, help circle back to what we were just talking about, this concept that it will help them instill confidence because they'll be able to say like, hey, I said I was going to show up on Tuesday and I showed up on Tuesday. Whether I woke up on Tuesday and I wanted to or not, I showed up. And I was respectful and I was humble. And I think if they can do those things in life, you set yourself up for so much success. That makes a lot of sense. So just showing up, like you were showing up for practice, as you continue to show up for practice, games, throwing the ball hard, as you put it, Yeah. when did that journey, I guess, really begin to the major leagues? Was it in high school when you started getting recruited by NCAA teams? Or For me, I would say it was my junior year of high school, which to give some, some context, that's really the year that colleges had started coming in and talking to me. I had started throwing a little bit harder. I had started getting on what I would call like the national recruiting circuit. So outside of the bubble of St. Louis or even the Midwest, had really been putting my skills to the test against people from California and Texas and Florida, where really the, are the hotbeds for baseball, to see how does my game stack up against some of these guys. And I started to see that I had the same ability, that I had the ability to potentially do this at a high level. Between getting recruited by colleges and then that ultimately cascading towards getting interest from professional baseball teams was, was a really surreal feeling. Again, my parents never, never let on. That was the type of ability I had. It was very much a head down mentality. I always remember my dad giving us this one piece of advice and always stuck with me was whatever it is in life, you're going to have one, potentially two opportunities to do it. But once that window or that door closes, as the analogy that he would use is, there might not be an opportunity to go back. And that always stuck with me because growing up, I mean, we had a batting cage in our backyard. Like I can remember going out there not wanting to, but at the same time, it was like, I remember my dad saying those words to me. And I was like, I, if this is something I really want. So I might as well give it everything I have and just see where, where the chips fall, so to speak. Uh, my dad actually says something very similar um, about business opportunities. Like if, if you wanted to start your company five years from now, it, let's just say you wanted to take a bigger break between yeah. business and baseball there's a chance that the same opportunities may not exist or maybe another competitor started five years ago and there's no room for you in the marketplace. So yeah. a very similar uh, line of thinking between sports and, and business, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious from your perspective, even how you've seen that play out in your life, because if your dad was talking to you that way, I'm sure there's been things that have come up where you're like, looking back, I'm glad I took that advice or looking back, I should have taken that advice in this specific situation. So it's funny, um, when I graduated from university and I wanted to jump right into business, 
he was trying to persuade me to get a job. And then I used that back at him. Oh, nice. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Kind of, you know, uh, making my case that I'm young. I have a lot of ideas and energy and I'm not married and I don't have kids. This is the perfect time. Risk before responsibility. Exactly. (laughs) I don't know who said that. It wasn't me. That's Uh, a great way of putting it. But (laughs) but somebody said that and I thought it was just a killer line. Risk before responsibility. It, It really is. And I... It's not possible for everyone, but if you are able to take that risk before you have real responsibilities, I think you have an insane advantage. Well, and I heard somebody even to touch on that further, you know, we both believe in entrepreneurship as a way to to generate good outcomes for both you, for your family, for your clients, for your business, for your employees. And when I think about entrepreneurship, that idea of risk before responsibility, right? We give generally four years to a college or secondary education for most people. Yet people won't give one or two years to investing in themselves in some sort of entrepreneurial journey. And and I always say like, we always think about the worst possible scenario. What's the worst possible outcome? But the worst possible outcome is like, you just go back to doing whatever you were going to do previously. Now, again, it has to be the right situation, but risk before responsibility, that really is the worst possible scenario. You spend two years investing in yourself. You learn probably a lot of skills. You learn a lot about yourself. And maybe then you go back and get a job if you don't feel like this is the right thing for you. It's kind of similar to how I was thinking about this this show. It's really, if I do it and it's not successful, number one, even if I reach five or 10 people, I'm happy. But number two, I'm learning how to be a better listener. Yeah. How to, actually, the better listener yeah. part goes back to our uh, the first time we met. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope I hope if I'm using some of those tips or, or techniques, it's not too obvious for you. But yeah, right. <laughs> oh, you're doing great. <laughs> I appreciate it. So just uh, so going back to high school, um, how did you make the decision to go to the college you went to, which I believe was North Carolina? So my journey was actually pretty unique. I had committed to go to school at University of North Carolina, ended up getting drafted out of high school, was the ninth overall pick. And my parents had always had the belief that, you know, you should go to college, you should get a degree. The opportunity to potentially play baseball at 18 was something that ultimately there was just too many things that were not worth passing up. So Ended up signing at 18. And then my college experience was was vastly different than most people. I went back and did school online uh, much later in my career, which was certainly a unique experience in and of itself. In college, you're you're playing at some point the major league teams start to court you. Is that right? Or are they not able to due to the fact that you're uh, an amateur athlete or a student athlete? Yeah. So the way the way it worked for me was um, so in high school. Teams are scouting me. And then the way the Major League Baseball draft works is you can either get drafted out of high school, and if you sign, you go to the minor leagues. And if you don't sign, you go to college, you play for three years, and then you could potentially get drafted again. For me, since I signed out of high school, I went straight to the minor leagues. So the way the minor leagues worked at the time was the Detroit Tigers, who I got drafted by, we had a rookie ball team. We had an A ball team. We had a high A team, a double A team, a triple A team, and then we had the big league team. So for me, when I first started, they assigned me to the rookie ball team. And what was funny to me was, uh, it's funny now, it wasn't funny at the time. I get drafted. I'm the first round draft pick. So I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And my first assignment is to go to the rookie ball team and then shag balls. Because as the rookie ball team, we want to make sure we have enough balls to play the next game and they're not going to refill the bucket every single time. So every foul ball in 100 degree weather in Lakeland, Florida was my job to go shag the balls. Now I understand. See, my confusion, and and I can blame it on being Canadian, is that uh, college sports aren't as big of a thing in yeah. Canada. So uh, now the story, based on what I read or heard, uh, yeah. makes a lot more sense for me. So you were 18, you got drafted, you yep. went to the minor leagues. And then from the minor leagues, you worked your way up to the majors, correct? Correct, yeah. Got it. Got it. And how long did it take you to to really work your way up to a position to where you stayed in the majors and, and you weren't fluctuating between the two? Still working on that. Uh, no, okay. I, so I spent a year and a half in the minor leagues. I spent a, so I signed, I 
basically you don't really play a full season that year, but I went to rookie ball, didn't ever play just shag balls. And then my next year I played half a season in low A, did pretty well, got promoted to high A, played half a season in high A. The following year I got assigned to the double A team out of spring training, played half a season there, got called up for one start. They were basically at the trade deadline. They were trading somebody away. I got called in to fill in for a spot while they were making this trade, make that start, then get sent back to AAA. Got called up a little bit later in the year. And then really from then on was either in the big leagues or in AAA. But um, that's the interesting thing even about like pro sports that I think relates to anybody and is a good lesson for anybody. People would always talk about sports, especially baseball, that it's easier to get there than it is to stay there. And whether it's business or sports, anything at a high level, it's easier to get there than it is to stay there. What I mean by that is when you get to the highest level, right, you've got there. And it can be very easy to let off the gas. But the reality of the situation is there's a bunch of other people that were just like Jacob that are just as talented that are coming behind me that might have a little more hunger because they've never been there. And now you got to keep fighting off those people every single year because they want your spot. They want your job. They want... They want your real estate. They want your building. They want the workflow that you have. So it's easier to get there than it is to stay there. And the lesson for me was always like, you got to keep your foot on the gas no matter what. Would it be fair to say that when you were in the minors, you were one of the highest paid guys there? Yeah. So when I signed, I was one of the highest paid high school draftees of all time. So the way the draft works was we really didn't make much money in the minor leagues, but you would make, you could potentially make a significant signing bonus, but it was all across the board. There were guys signing for millions of dollars. There were guys signing for hundreds of thousands of dollars. There were guys signing for next to nothing. Then you all go to the minor leagues together. So it's a really interesting dynamic where, you know, some guys are coming into the minor leagues with a ton of resources behind them that they could potentially use to help them throughout their career. Other guys are getting to the end of a baseball season and they're saying, hey, I got to go find an Uber so I can start working and make some money in the offseason or teach lessons. I'm still kind of getting hung up on this. So for a guy to go from, you know, high school to the majors and get that million dollar signing bonus or whatever it is, or it fluctuates, right? Hundreds of thousands, millions, whatever the case is. uh, That's very rare versus the college path, right? Definitely more rare. Okay. Really, the guys that are getting drafted and signed out of high school for the most part are guys with elite talent that have potentially elite upside. So teams are willing to pay them enough money that they're willing to give up a scholarship. You know, for me, I gave up a scholarship to go to the University of North Carolina, which one, would be would have been a ton of fun. Two, they had a really good baseball program that had continually produced high draft picks. And three, it was a great education. So it takes a lot of leverage that the team has to deploy in order to get a high school player to sign out of high school. Because once you pass up on that scholarship, there's no going back, right? There's, it's, you know, you go to the majors and you either have success, you sink or swim. For the most part, yeah. I mean, I was fortunate. I was able to get money that I could go back and use for school, but that college experience wasn't anything like a normal college experience that an 18 to 22 year old kid. And especially if you've ever been to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, a great university with a great campus and everything like that. So I never got that experience uh, back for sure. Sure. One thing, and you kind of briefly touched on it, that I find fascinating about you is you saw massive success at a young age and you still had the motivation to get up and keep working, to keep going at it. Maybe you weren't as hungry as other guys, or maybe you were, but would you say that uh, just your head down mentality from when you were younger helped you in the major leagues as well? Or was it something else, maybe something bigger, another, a different fire that's inside of you that's maybe not inside of everyone? For me, I always had the same thought process. And my thought process was this. I wanted to make sure that whenever my career was over, that I really didn't have any regret. I knew going into baseball that baseball is going to be fleeting. It's going to last for a certain period of time, but this is not what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life, right? If you're a Hall of Fame baseball player, you play 20 years in the big leagues. If you play 10 years in the big leagues, you're in the top 2% of guys, I think, that have ever played the game. With that, I wanted to make sure that every single day that I was that I put in the work I needed to put in. One thing I learned in baseball was that there's going to be a lot of things that are outside of your control. It's that way for anything in life, but there's certain things that are totally inside your control. 
So what are the things that are totally inside of my control that I can show up and do every single day? And then I can be completely comfortable with whatever the results are. Do you still apply a lot of that to your life today? The things that are completely in your control is what you're focused on. Like, uh, for example, with baseball, maybe that's practicing two to three hours a day. And I don't know if that's yeah. way off or, or if yeah. that's accurate. And then uh, today, maybe that's waking up early and exercising before you start work. Like, uh, have you seen a lot of that carry over to chapter two or the new phase? Selfishly, yes. I say selfishly because for me, I have to have stuff that I can have control over the outcome throughout my day. As we both know in business and entrepreneurship, one plus one does not always equal two. One plus one plus one could equal zero. One plus one plus one could equal 100. But sometimes what that equals is completely outside of your control. So for me, something that's really helped me has just been having things that I can control on a daily basis that I know that I can put the inputs to get the outputs I want. You mentioned one of them. I mean, one of them is just working out every single day. But for me, it's it's a cliche term, but it's doing things that are high leverage activities that I know that, hey, on Monday, this might not have a direct result on Tuesday. But on Monday of 2022 versus Monday of 2023, it's going to have a pretty good good result. So, I mean, there's certain things I'm, I'm even doing today that are just very focused on what are things that are inside of my bubble that I can control that no matter what the output is, I know that's outside of my control. You touched on, you know, Monday 2022 versus 2023. So the way I like to look at some of the stuff I do is every day I'm laying bricks, but maybe once every few months or once a year, I'll, I'll stand back and look at the wall and make sure that the wall is looking the way I want it to look. Yeah. Do you do any sort of annual planning, quarterly planning, maybe even monthly, weekly in your I life? I do. I do. I have a, I have a whiteboard in my office that had it has all the quarters on it and then it what i do is i update the quarters as they go by so my goal is that i always am four quarters out i'm always a year out of here's the things i want to be doing and then i have my goals on there and generally the goals are things that maybe some of them are stretch goals but i know that if i keep doing those inputs every single day that at the end of the year those outputs should equate to that and it is it is interesting i actually just last week looked at the board and I had a couple goals on there and two of the goals, I had five goals on there, three of the goals I've reached, two of the goals I smashed and two of the goals are within reach, but I haven't really put a ton of time and effort because I haven't stood back and looked at the wall and said, Oh wait, I, I forgot. I wanted, I wanted that thing on the wall too, but it, it is helpful. As you know, there's a lot of things <laughs> from a day-to-day perspective sometimes that just don't go your way. And it's really helpful to be able to look back and and see like how far have I actually come in the past 12 months? Well, first of all, congratulations on hitting most of those goals. Uh, would you say it's a result of your hard work and perseverance and really coming into your own as an entrepreneur, or maybe you were not being um, as aggressive with the goals as you might have been when you had goals in sports? Uh, and And just for context for the listeners, how long have you been an entrepreneur now and and when did you found moment? Yeah, so we founded the business uh, two and a half years ago now. And to answer your other question, for me, ultimately reaching those goals has just been showing up every single day. But it took me a while to realize what I needed to do when I was showing up. One of the biggest struggles for me as an entrepreneur when I first started was you have so much freedom. And that can be a great thing. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people start businesses because they want the freedom. It's the thing that I love the most about the business. But on the flip side of that, when you show up, there's nobody telling you what to do. And a lot of times we can fall into this trap of feeling busy, but really we're not doing anything that's going to truly move the needle. So I'd actually kick that back to you. I'd love to hear from you in your journey as you think about everything that you've accomplished along the way how have you come to realize what are the things I really should be doing? Or the cliche thing would be like the highest leverage activities inside my business. So I started off doing everything, um, single man shop for the first two years. And uh, I got used to, or maybe it was kind of the way I grew up as well, just feeling like you really put in a hard day of work when you're actually working, doing things you know, making things happen and seeing the results of it. Uh, So it wasn't until eight years into my entrepreneurial journey that I truly started to focus on delegation and trying to do the high leverage activities. 
Um, so about two years ago, I started to put the plan in motion to remove myself from the day to day as much as I possibly can and to focus on the things that I, I feel that I'm best at, which is yeah. strategy, kind of high level uh, thinking about the organization, how we can improve or, or where the future growth may be. Uh, so the way I measure it now is the impact it has to the NOI or the bottom line. Because uh, I can, if I don't think about it through that lens, I can very easily find myself getting stuck or hung up on, let's say, a $10 bill and then possibly missing a $20,000 uh, opportunity to reduce costs. So yeah. that's the way that I'm looking at it today. But uh, definitely in the beginning, it wasn't. It sounds like you've had that, that I guess, the right way of thinking is maybe not the right way to put it, but uh, the way that I feel is the right way of thinking about your company and entrepreneurship uh, from the beginning. Was that a result of just being deliberate about how you started the company or um, some of your growth along the way? Because it's only been two and a half years. It took me eight years to figure that out. <laughs> One thing that baseball gave me that I'm super grateful for is it just gave me a lot of life experiences at a really young age. It helped me grow up really fast. I mean, I was doing, I think you... You nailed it. I was sinking or swimming at 18 years old when a lot of my friends were off pledging at a fraternity. And I was doing things that there was no backstop. There was nobody there saying like, hey, Jacob, and giving me a pat on the butt. It was like, you either perform or we're going to send you down or we're going to get rid of you. There's no like 90-day improvement plan. It's like, you either do the job we signed you for or we're going to find somebody else the next year. So for me... That experience, I'm so grateful that I had so much of that life experience. I think it's helped transition into business. But from a big picture standpoint, the thing that it's helped me the most with is just understanding that whether it's business, whether it's sports, whether it's relationships, it's all this constant journey. There's really no end destination, at least for me. It's understanding that at each stage of the journey, there's going to be things that I enjoy doing. There's going to be things that I don't enjoy doing. And there's always going to be new struggles. There's always going to be new successes, but we have to embrace the journey. And for me, you know, two and a half years as an entrepreneur, I'm so thankful of like all the experiences I've had. And I look back at some of the things that, man, look at all those mistakes I made. But the reality is like, sometimes you got to make the mistakes to learn along the way. This episode is brought to you by Storyboard Living. We're actively buying apartment communities in the St. Louis region, Southern Illinois, and Southern Missouri. We make transactions easy and we've never gone under contract on an acquisition that we didn't close. We also offer a finder's fee and broker's bonus for off-market deals. If you have a property that may be a good fit for us, email deals at storyboardliving.com. That's deals at storyboardliving.com. The uh, MLB career not turning out the way you wanted it to, that wasn't due to any mistakes on your part, correct? It was just kind of the way it ended up working out due to no fault of your own or anyone else's? You know, that's, that's a good question. It's a loaded question. If I had to go back and do it over again with the mindset that I have today, would the results have been different? Potentially, I felt like I put in all the work I could have put in. The results were not what I was hoping they would have been when I first started out in my baseball journey. I mean, I played 11 years professionally. I played parts of eight seasons in, in, in the big league. So not by any stretch a complete failure, but the reality is as a top 10 pick, and I write about this online, that I feel like I had a bottom 20% career outcome. Because the reality as a top 10 pick is like you're expected to be a pretty consistent big leaguer. Maybe you make a couple all-star teams a couple outlier scenarios where you like end up in like hall of fame type territory, right? If you look at the people that got drafted around me, some of them have had really long, prolonged success in the big leagues. But to answer your question, I don't think there's anything that I look at it as I did the work. There's things that I know now that if I would have known then maybe change some of the paths that I went down and maybe I'm able to, to make adjustments quicker than I was as an 18, 22, 25 year old kid. And do you mean just like in terms of the way you were practicing, for example, or maybe even in-game decisions? More so on the mental and on the mental side of the game and the mental side of life in general, 
understanding how to bounce back from failure when it's such public failure. It's very hard as an athlete to be able to tell anybody else about it because it's when you fail, you might fail in front of 40,000 people and you're expected to show up the next day and be working hard. And it's one thing to put the work in, but it's one thing to be emotionally back engaged and emotionally have cleared the system, so to speak, to be ready to perform the following time you're out there. It's a very challenging thing to do at any age, but especially as a a 20 something year old, that's frankly trying to figure out who they are as a person and who they they're trying to figure out life too. Right. Yeah. I can't imagine. And that's incredible pressure to have on you. Uh, So near the tail end of your career, is that when you started to think about next steps and came up with the idea or had the light bulb moment for moment, if you will? I wish I had some great, amazing story of like, I was sitting in this one chair and I read this book and I saw this quote and I thought like I should do that. But the reality is it was, it was a gradual progression throughout my baseball journey signing for a lot of money, having the responsibility of saying, I want to be a good steward of this money, learning, reading books along the way, hiring people, firing people, building the team of people around me, understanding what what I felt like I needed to have success, both on and off the field, all led to me saying, when I got done, okay, I think I want to do something around personal finance. My original thought was I want to do something around personal finance to help educate people around it because I hated the feeling I felt at 18, and I think a lot of people feel this no matter what age they're at, where they just feel a little uncertain or uneasy. Am I doing this right? So that was my original thought. I didn't love financial advisors, so I thought, like, I don't know if I want to do that. And originally, I was like, I'll just go work for somebody else. I'll make a little bit of money. I'll have this as kind of like the side deal I'm doing and and work on raising my kids and really focus on that. I did that for a little bit and I just realized I was kind of bored. I needed more. I I needed to have more of a purpose for what I was trying to build towards, which ultimately led to the entrepreneurship journey and, and starting the business. A big part of it then is kind of going back in our conversation to wanting to reach your potential or see how far you can take it. Yeah. Like we have one shot at life. And one thing I'm a big believer in is like, we all fail. Okay. Whether you whether it's the person that you're looking up to or the person that's 10 steps behind you, everybody's failing. Everybody puts their pants on the same way. And we all have one shot to do this thing. And I really don't want to get to the end of my life and think, man, I wish I would have tried that. I never tried that. And what we talked about before, like what's the worst case scenario? It doesn't work. And you go back to doing whatever you were doing before. And on top of that, you've learned all these skills. Like I think that's a pretty good worst case scenario. I agree. And I think one of the best things you can do for your kids as well is just show them that example of, you know, a father that's willing to take risks and put it all on the line to try and achieve their goals or their dreams. 100%. And what I would add to that too is for me, and I'm sure you feel this way, you want your kids, it's one thing to tell our kids that you have to work hard in life and that nothing in life will be given to you. But the reality is, we want our kids to be able to see that in us. That means a lot more than any words that we speak to them. And for me, getting out of baseball, I, I didn't want to be the the former player that sat at home all day, that played golf, that my kids saw, and they never really saw the work that it took to live the life that we're able to live. And I think that was a huge thing for me. I want my kids to be able to see that like it takes work. It takes effort. This isn't just something that you can just you know, flip the switch on and you can start, you know, collecting all the benefits of it. It takes putting in the time day in, day out. My next question was actually going to be, aside from uh, reaching your potential, how else did you find the motivation to want to start your entrepreneurial journey? But it sounds like it's reaching your potential and setting an example for your kids. Because if we're being honest, there are people who have had maybe one-tenth the success that you had financially that will put it on cruise control. But you didn't do that. You jumped right into learning an entirely new craft, you know, facing a similar challenge as you faced to when you were trying to make the MLB, but now you're trying to grow a, a successful, and you have grown a successful, profitable company. Yeah. I love the challenge and I, and I enjoy the journey and I enjoy the fact that I know I'm not going to have all the answers on day one. And I love learning and I love using my, ma- my brain to problem solve and think about solutions. And, and ultimately, it goes back to like what I talked about earlier about my goal when I started, when I got done with baseball, I was like, I just want to help educate people around experiences that I've had. 
I didn't know what form or fashion that would come in, but I feel like I've found a way to do it in a way that's meaningful for me, that impacts the people I work with in a really positive way, that gives me purpose in my day-to-day life, and also helps for me, you know, personally have the drive to want to continue to pursue the next big thing and the next big thing. In a nutshell, uh, what exactly does moment do? Because you hear the phrase, you know, uh, wealth management thrown around all over the place. And if you're not in that world, you may not know exactly what that means. Yeah. So what do you guys do? What makes you different? And has that changed since you started the company two and a half years ago? You know, have you spotted opportunities in the marketplace to where you said, hey, we need to pivot and start to provide X or Y? Yeah. Yeah. So what do we do? I think about this from the standpoint of like, what is the dream outcome for the clients that we work with? And the dream outcome for me, for the clients we work with is that when they lay their head on the pillow at night, they know they're doing everything they can in their personal financial life to maximize all the sacrifices they're making. Because the reality is what we actually do from a strategic standpoint is going to be different for everybody because money is different for everybody and how they think about it and what they're trying to accomplish. But the dream outcome is that they sit there and they say like, hey, I know I'm good. I know that I'm doing everything I can possibly do to maximize all the time, the effort, that sacrifices that I'm making in my personal life, whether that's building a business or otherwise, to support my family or reach the goals that I want to reach. To your second point, what makes us different? When I think about that question, I think about the the, the last question you asked is like, what has changed? One thing I've been very cognizant of since we started this business is, what are things that we can do to go deeper in the client relationships that we have, both from a strategic standpoint, but also a psychological standpoint for the specific clients we're working with? So if we're talking about athletes and entrepreneurs, the areas that they have their greatest needs are going to be far different than if you were a traditional retiree or you were a corporate executive. And understanding what those issues are and saying, like, how can we best solve that problem? How can we best solve that problem to one, give them back their time? How can we best solve that problem to make that happen as fast as humanly possible for them? And ultimately get them to that dream outcome where they're saying like, hey, these guys are such an integral part of my team. I I don't feel like I could be doing everything I'm doing without them. I think athletes and entrepreneurs in general are, are very comfortable with risk. So it sounds like a part of what you guys do is, like you mentioned, helping them sleep at night is providing them with that risk management in their their finances. Yeah, it's helping to give them a a fresh set of eyes that gets them outside of whatever their traditional way of thinking is. Every athlete wants to be an entrepreneur and a lot of entrepreneurs want to be athletes. And the reality is no matter what you are in life, it doesn't mean you're going to be good at something else just because you were good at the other thing. One of the biggest challenges is like they're so comfortable taking risk that how do you help show somebody that maybe sometimes you don't have to take as much risk, that you can create optionality by taking a little bit less risk in some areas of your life that can ultimately benefit the areas that you are taking the risk in. For the athlete, it's saying, hey, I know we've made a lot of money and you potentially have this great lifestyle, but remember, we have another 50, 60 years Lord willing to live and be able to support yourself and be able to support your family. And for them, it's figuring out how do I start using the money that I have, not only to live the lifestyle I want, but also start to explore things that are going to potentially give me purpose when I'm done playing. Do you guys combine the financial element with different insurance products, or do you view that as one and the same? So we do not sell any insurance products. Um, We advise on insurance products. And I'll tell you the reason why I feel very strongly about this is when I was 18 years old, I got sold an insurance policy that did... Nobody any good except for the individual that sold me the policy. He made a lot of money on the policy. I didn't know that at the time. And insurance is a unique beast because 99.9% of people need some form of insurance. And the reality is, I don't know what the percentage is, but let's call it 90% or more by the wrong type in the wrong amount for the wrong reasons. And it's such an interesting thing because it, it's a... Uh, It's an integral part of somebody's personal financial life or their business for a lot of different reasons. But the way that it sometimes gets communicated and sold um, can be a bit of a challenge. I think I I understand where you're going with that. The incentives are misaligned if you're selling the product versus consulting on the product. 
I would say so. Yeah. I, one thing that for me, I always wanted to make sure of in this business, and it came from a lot of my own experiences, was I never wanted the clients that we work with to be able to sit on the other side of the table and even have the slightest thought of, are they recommending this because it's better for them or it's better for me? One of the most rewarding things I had recently was we had a new client come on and and I asked them after they came on, I said, you know, what led you to, to wanting to ultimately, they booked a call, we had a discussion, they became a client. And he said, you know, I just, I just wanted to have somebody that I knew was going to do the right thing for me. And it's sad that when we, anybody that's giving you financial advice should be giving you financial advice that's in your best interest. It's sad that I even have to say that, but it's, it's what my mission is in, in this industry as a whole. There's a lot of advice out there that just frankly, like, it's not in the best interest of the clients. It's in the best interest of the company that's selling the product. It's in the best interest of the advisor that's pitching the product. And uh, I'm hoping to change that. Well, for what it's worth, I think you are the perfect person to change that. You have the self-discipline, which is very evident in the way you take care of yourself and you control every aspect of your life and to uh, improve your life daily. Um, and also, you seem very honest and you're independently wealthy. So you, you really don't need to uh, get wealthy by uh, misguiding someone. Yeah. Not to say anyone else needs to do that, but uh, for you, there's definitely no incentive there, especially if your goal is just to grow the best business you can build. Yeah. Yeah, and I try to I try to be totally transparent both through share through stories I share, whether that's online, but a lot of times with clients is I'll share unique details and specific details of like what I'm what I'm doing. And I'll tell them like, here's how I came to that decision. That doesn't mean that they should be doing the same thing. But I do think it it helps to build trust. Ultimately, like I'm in a trust business. And what a huge blessing it is when somebody says, like, hey, Jacob, like we're gonna trust you with everything we've worked for. It's also a huge responsibility, but I want to always be instilling back in them that like, we are on the bus with you. And I I want all the clients that we work with to know that, that the advice that I'm giving you is the same advice that I'm taking myself. It doesn't mean that we're invested the exact same way because your goals are gonna be different than my goals. But the reality is like, I'm eating my own cooking. Um, and I, I tell people that. I, I told a, an athlete that uh, here recently that was interviewing a couple different firms and I said, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to show you like exactly what I'm doing, like my statements and everything, like here's exactly what I'm doing. And for no other reason, just to show them that, hey, everything that I'm talking to you about is, is what I'm doing with my own money. Are you able to share what you would advise a, a young athlete on if they were to come to you and say, hey, you know what? I just got a, a $5 million signing bonus and I want to uh, place that with moment. Yeah. Um, just very high level. Yeah, first step is we want to build the team. Look, this is a, a team thing that we are in. And the way that I describe it is we we try to be the quarterback of the team. But if I think about an athlete or an entrepreneur, really, who else is on the team? Generally, there's going to be a CPA on the team. Generally, you're going to have some, some level of attorney on the team, most likely an estate planning attorney. You're going to have an insurance agent for things like life insurance if there's a need there. You're going to have a property and casualty agent for things like homeowners, auto, umbrella. Step one is helping to build the team of people around them, finding trusted, vetted experts that are A players in their space that can all be consultants on the team, that can give their advice, that can give their two cents around here's some strategies, some solutions that might make sense. You know, I think the second thing is helping those young athletes, but really for anybody, helping them understand what the value of a dollar is. The value of a dollar for every single person is different. And what I mean by that is, the value of your dollar is going to be different whether you're an 18-year-old or whether you're a 38-year-old or whether you're a 68-year-old. One, because you have a lot longer to potentially invest money or do different things. The other way it's going to be a lot different is if I gave you a dollar and I said, hey, Raj, how much do you think you can make on this dollar in the next 10 years? That answer is probably going to be different than what I would tell an athlete because there's different skills that you have that might be able to take that dollar and maybe two or three exit versus the athlete might be saying like, hey, really all I need to do with the dollar is hit singles and doubles because like I got this big payout versus the entrepreneur might say, I really need to make sure that like I've capitalized on this dollar before I start and start hitting singles and doubles over here. So step one, build the team. Um, but step two, just understand what the value of the dollar is for you as an individual. When you say build the team and you mentioned all these key players, are these key players that are third parties uh, that you're bringing to the table? Yeah. What if, what if the athlete said, "Hey, I have you know three people that I want on the team." It, it, that's I'm assuming not a problem on your end. 
Yeah, I am not in the business of breaking up good relationships. And that's the line that I use. And the way I describe it is every single person on the team should be being held accountable for the work that they're doing, including moment. If we're not doing a good job, I would hope the CPA would go to the client and say, hey, I saw some things on the tax return that just don't look right. I think you should ask these questions. That is the ultimate goal, that every single person on the team is being held accountable because whether it's the entrepreneur that we're working with or whether it's the athlete they're working with, they are hiring us to do a job for them. We are a small, small piece of their success. They're the ones putting in the hard work. It's really our job to help protect it. And when I think about that team, I I love it when people bring other individuals to the table. We have those conversations. We're in those meetings with them. And if at any point they feel like, you know, they've either graduated from that individual or they want to talk to other people, we have a group of people that that we can bring in that we can interview as well. And and the team that you would bring in from day one, that's a team that can grow with the athlete or, or with yeah. the entrepreneur as their balance sheet grows? Yeah. Yeah. The way I look at it is, um, you know, we have athletes all the way from guys that just got drafted to, to guys that are making tens of millions of dollars a year that made the all-star team. You know, we have entrepreneurs that are just hitting the J curve in their business to entrepreneurs that have been doing this thing for 30 years and are exiting their business and getting their big payout. You want to make sure that the people that are on your team are the right people for each stage. And that doesn't, the people that you started with aren't always the people that you finish with. And it's really our job to make sure that the people that are on your team are the right people for each stage. You know, if you're a, if you're an entrepreneur, you're an athlete, and you're just starting out, chances are you don't need you know, CPA one, you might need CPA two because like they're really focused on that group of people. But as you continue to progress and now all of a sudden there's more complexity in your business and you have 10 plus employees, there might be some more things that you need in your business. So making sure that the people on your team are always consistent with the stage of growth that you're at. And how did you develop the network of uh, folks you may recommend? On the athlete side specifically, a lot of the people that we help build the team are people that I have come in contact with over the last 15 years. Um, Athletics is a big world, but also a really small world. And you're kind of, it's kind of like St. Louis. You're like one connection away from everybody. So that's how we built it on the athlete side. On the entrepreneur side, a lot of it's been over the past two and a half years building the business. And uh, even probably the year and a half before that, just continuing to go out and find vetted experts and asking to see like copies of their work. Like, let me see like the work you're doing for clients and also holding them accountable and telling them like, I want to be held accountable too. But like, if you know we review every client's tax return, that's not because I don't trust their CPA. That's just simply because like, we're all human beings. And at the end of the day, there might be a mistake there. If there's a mistake there, I want the CPA to get better. I want us to get better because ultimately we are hired to do a job for the client. That makes a lot of sense. Are you able to go nationwide uh, with your clients, if someone were to call you from Alaska and say, uh, can you, uh, can we work with Moment, uh, would that be an issue at all? We are. Uh, we actually just uh, most likely just recently brought on a client from Canada. So Really? Okay. So uh, you're going across the border. Okay. Yeah. So we, you know, with the power of technology nowadays, um, combining that with what we talked about at the beginning, St. Louis values, like I believe that in person is the best way to do anything in life. I love flying to go see new clients, having those initial conversations with them because there's just a lot of trust that's being able to build in person. So the short answer to the question is, yeah, we work with clients all across the country um, and it gives us such a unique perspective. You know, the athlete side is interesting because like I, for lack of a better term, know the ins and outs. The entrepreneur side to me is always so fascinating because like we'll bring on somebody and they'll tell us about their business and how they're making money. And I, I just find it so fascinating uh, how people came to the journey that they're on, how they started the business, why they're doing that, what their goals are for it, their vision, et cetera. I agree. I, I love having those conversations, of course, not as in-depth as you. It's very rare that I'm sitting with someone and they pull out their balance sheet or yeah. financial statement. But uh, it, it's uh, there's so much opportunity out there. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, so given the fact that you've been to Canada, I'm assuming multiple times, I would imagine you're well-traveled. Uh, I am. It, being well-traveled, you still left St. Louis and came back to St. Louis. Yeah. Now, as an outsider, I think St. Louis is an incredible region. Um, I love living here, raising my family here. Um, was it just the family friendliness that you touched on and the ethics or the morals of, of people in St. Louis in general that brought you back? Or, or was it anything else? I think family for me was was one of the biggest reasons. But the other thing that I would say is I'm a pretty simple guy. Uh, I like the pace of life in St. Louis. 
And it just feels like home. There's just something about it for me that is comfortable. I can always go visit other places, but having my family here, building my business with my brother here, uh, I wouldn't trade that for anything. You can't beat that. Um, I I agree. And, and I have a similar outlook. Uh, my brother recently moved here from uh, Canada. So we're from oh, the, nice. yeah, we're from the uh, greater Toronto area, okay. Brampton to be exact. So my brother and a childhood friend of mine, they both moved down here earlier this year. And I have a long list of Canadians that uh, I'll be moving to St. Louis to help uh, help with our population trajectory, if you will. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, my what is the building in Toronto that has where you can like hang off the edge? The CN Tower. Yeah. So we did that one year when we were playing the Blue Jays, uh, which was a cool experience. But Toronto's a great area. And you hung off the edge. Yeah. Okay. So you're not afraid of uh, uh, heights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't love heights, but sure. for some reason there was something about like all the procedures that they had in place that I felt more comfortable. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I would imagine uh, that's uh, quite the undertaking for them to to get that right. Yeah. And uh, now that I think about it, I wonder what their insurance policy looks like. Uh, I'm sure it's high. <laughs> uh, we like to end every show with what we call a hole in one segment. Uh, just your biggest piece of advice for anyone listening uh, that they can apply today to their life or business. And if it's more than one, um, that's fine. But just something that they can apply immediately that will improve their trajectory or their current situation. Just take the first step. Every single person that's listening to this has the thing that they're thinking about doing. And it just requires you taking the first step. I've never in my life looked back over the previous year, much like we talked about, and thought, man, I wish I wouldn't have taken that first step. Now, that doesn't mean that it was all successes and all failures and all roses. The reality is there was a lot of failures along the way, but I'm also always thankful that I just started doing it. And it sounds so cliche, but that's the reality is like, you're never going to, you're never going to read enough books that are going to push you over the edge. Sometimes you just got to do it. I love it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I fully agree with that as well. There's only so much that you can take away from theory. Sometimes you have to be in the field and you have to get a real feel and just learn from experience. Um, Thank you so much for your time, Jacob. I truly appreciate it. Um, Is there anything that we missed that you'd like to tell viewers, listeners? How can they get in touch with you or Moment? Yeah, I I share a lot of stuff online, uh, mostly on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'll be on YouTube here pretty soon. I'm also on Instagram as well. So you can find me on kind of all the major platforms. I share a lot of personal finance knowledge, a lot of things about sports and money and entrepreneurship and lessons I've learned along the way. So you can always connect with me on there. And then our website is momentprivatewealth.com. Thanks again. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Raj. If you're a high quality company, interested in reaching the high performing audience of Country Club Conversations, let's see how we can work together. To explore sponsorship opportunities, email advertising at storyboardliving.com. That's advertising at storyboardliving.com.